it there. Um, all right, that's, that's good. So uh, welcome to Brookings United Church of Christ. Good to see you all here this morning. And uh, just wanted to start our worship service as we do each week with a few announcements that Gary's going to share with us at this time. I haven't done this for a while, so little details. Two Rivers Association hosting a meeting April 28th, Centerville, UCC. I was already asked where Centerville is. It's down southwest of Sioux Falls. It's not that terribly far. Please let Pastor Mark or the office know if you're interested in attending. Our April cause of the month is Creation Care. We'll be doing several activities for this, and one of them that is already planned, April 22nd, is a park cleanup. Meet at the church at 5.30. We don't know which park yet. The city will, shall I say, dictate where we're going to clean up. On Tuesday mornings, we have Coffee and Conversation in downtown Cottonwood Coffee, 10.30, 11.30, Wednesday, something to chew on here at the church, 6.30 p.m. Everyone is welcome. Anything else that anyone has? That... All right. If not, thank you, Gary. And I'm going to invite you all this time to stand and join together in our opening song of praise this morning, Goodness of God. Okay. Should we hold up? Go ahead.
remain standing for the call to worship. We gather as people on a journey. We believe, we have doubts. We do good and we sin. We are imperfect humans, yet still beloved by God. Love and grace, hope and faith, these are the essence of the one we call God. We seek forgiveness and grace from the one and from those whom we harm. Assured of that grace, we are ready to grow again. We yearn for a new way, a new perspective, and a clear path. Though we are full of trust and full of doubt, we are here. Speak to us, God. Continue creating us. Inspire our hearts, enlighten our minds, guide our actions. Please take, please take this moment to greet your neighbors this morning. Hey, Laura. And you may be seated. And our worship leader, Gary, still has a microphone in hand. And so uh, if you have something to uh, lift up this morning, a joy, something great happening uh, this week in your life, and uh, also is something that you would like to ask for prayers from your brothers and sisters. Raise your hand. Gary will find you. Uh, we have a youth from our first, our early days in youth ministry in Sioux Falls who is on life support. And she, they don't know what caused it, but she, um, yeah, she's, the family is going through a lot right now. So I just want to lift Megan up in prayer. Along that line, I have a niece, eight months pregnant, and she's in Sioux Falls with pneumonia and too weak for a cesarean. So prayers for Ashley, please, that she gets strength and successful delivery. Anybody having a joy this week? Celebrating anything? Happy about anything? Some joy about anything? It is called joys and concerns too, you know? So. Well, if there are no others, let's come to the Lord in a moment of silent prayer, and I will lead us into the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, we just lift up to you the prayers that you have heard through the silence of our hearts, as well as those things that were mentioned aloud, Lord, and we pray specifically um, for those who are in, in need of your healing touch and also uh, for those families who are um, grieving the loss of a, of a loved one. Lord, we just pray that you would be in the midst of each of those situations. And Lord, as we gather together this second week of the Easter season, Lord, the, 
the resurrection Sunday that we celebrated last Sunday was just one day within this ongoing season that we continue to celebrate through the day of Pentecost, seven weeks from now. And Lord, so help us to continue to, to live into this new season, the season of, of birth and new life and, and new growth and spring and all of the things that, that come together to represent this season. Lord, we just pray that you'd be um, with us as we seek out to follow you the way uh, that your disciples uh, did, the ones who you breathed out the Holy Spirit onto them in your resurrected body, Lord. And my, may, you, may you breathe out your Holy Spirit on us so we might breathe in that Spirit and be able to, to live it out in the world around us, to the people among us. So we lift up all of these things in the, in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray as we pray together. Our Creator God, who reigns in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So let's join together in singing hymn number 49. Ask me what great thing I know. today, put it on your bulletin as well as on the screens in front of you. Today, O oh God, we are reminded by your holy word of what people of faith are like. We are reminded of their joy and trust in you. We are reminded of how they care for one another and reach out to help their brothers and sisters. We are reminded of how your presence in their lives conquers their doubts and fears. Lord, work strongly in us and conform our lives to the example of Jesus and of all those with a living faith. Help us to walk in your glorious light and rejoice in your saving truth. Gracious God, we recall how the sadness of the disciples was turned to joy and of how their fear was turned to courage by your risen presence. Help us show your present reality to all those around us who dwell in fear and sadness. Help us and the people of Christ everywhere to bring comfort to those who grieve, strength to those who are ill, and blessings to all those in need. Lord, hear our prayer too for those in special need of your presence this day. 
that your son might visit them and speak a word of healing, that your nameless servants in this world might bring unto them your comfort and your grace. We thank you, O God, for your power and presence in our lives. Make us known as a people who share that power and presence so that the glory we intend to give unto you may be given by all and so that our joy may be complete in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And at this time, uh, Rachel's going to share with us uh, a song by Casting Crowns. It's entitled uh, Life Song, and it, and it does the words of this song do speak to um, what it means to, to live a life uh, that is good and pleasing uh, to Christ. So the song is Life Song. So the scripture I'd like to share with you all this morning is from the Gospel of John. It's chapter 19, excuse me, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. In the New Living Translation, it says this. 
That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I seal the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So this morning, I'm beginning a new series entitled Seven Questions of Faith, which we'll be covering during the period between now and Pentecost. So the first question that all people who claim the Christian faith should ask of themselves is, is Jesus real to me? Of course, this isn't a question that atheists ask or one that people of other faiths ask, but it is one that Christians should reflect upon. But of course, the the very first group of men and women to follow Jesus followed him literally. They walked with him and talked with him and served other people alongside of him. So when they had seen him die, they thought that was the end until they saw him again in his resurrected form. That's the Easter message I covered last week. But as we just heard in this morning's scripture, Jesus appears again after his initial resurrection encounter with the the first few disciples. And this time, he somehow enters a room where it is emphasized that the doors are locked. So we are not told how this actually happened, but we are told that Thomas was not there for some reason. However, when he does arrive, among the other among the other disciples, he is told the story about Jesus being alive and visiting them. But Thomas doesn't believe them. And this is the point where he gets a bad rap, right? The truth is, he responded in the same way that all of us probably would have. He's just a normal human being. And he has his own story to tell. I remember the first time somebody called me a disciple of Jesus. Yeah, a disciple. Had a nice ring to it. It felt um, strong. You realized you were a part of something much bigger than yourself. Sometimes it was really, really tough. See, I, I can't begin to describe just how disorienting things were back then. I mean, one minute Jesus is telling you about 
uh, the gift of life, and the next minute it seems like he's just going to let us drown in the middle of the sea. <laughs> Spoiler alert, we didn't drown. Sure seemed like we were going to. Looking back on it, I realized that Jesus didn't waste a moment. I mean, he was always showing us that he was who he said he was. Which, I know, begs the question, how could we doubt him? Yeah, I tend to be the one that gets asked that more than anybody because for some reason, doubter has been connected with my name. For the record, I wasn't the only one who doubted. It's just, I wasn't there the day that Jesus appeared to everyone else. I, I, I was gone. And, and so I didn't, there, look, the finality of death, it has a, uh, a choking grip on all of us. And on that day that Jesus was crucified, when, um, and death swallowed him up. And then there was the day that um, they showed me his hands and the scars. And he said, Thomas, you believe because you see. But there's going to be people who believe and don't see. that night it changed everything I mean I was still a disciple but now now I was an apostle sent to share the good news to tell a story you know there's a uh, there's another word yeah, started with a few of us began to spread I think it's the best word of all. It says everything that needs to be said because we realized it wasn't about how well we believed. It was about who we believed in. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. <laughs> yeah, from that moment on, we were called believers. So Thomas calls himself a believer. But what does that mean to be a believer in a, in a broad context? Does, does it describe a person who falls for anything they're told? Well, that's the challenge which transpires uh, each year in certain circles on April 1st, which was just last Easter Monday, the day we now come to call April Fool's Day, right? So have any of you ever fallen for an April Fool's prank or joke? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Well, there have been some rather dubious April Fool Day pranks, on, actually on a national scale. Maybe you even fell for one of these April Fool's Day hoaxes on April 1st, 1996. The Taco Bell Corporation took out a full-page ad that appeared in six major newspapers announcing that it had bought the Liberty Bell and was renaming it the Taco Liberty Bell. Hundreds of outraged citizens called the National Historic Park in Philadelphia where the bell was housed to express their anger. Their nerves were only calmed when Taco Bell revealed a few hours later that it was a practical joke. But the best line of the day came when my White House Press Secretary Mike McCurry was asked about the sale. And thinking on his feet, he responded that the Lincoln Memorial had also been sold, and it would now be known as the Ford Lincoln Mercury Memorial. <laughs> then a couple years later, in 1998, Burger King published a full-page advertisement in USA Today 
announcing the introduction of their new item, the left-handed Whopper, specifically designed for the 32 million left-handed Americans. According to the advertisement, the, the new Whopper included the same ingredients as the original, lettuce, tomato, hamburger patty, etc. But all the condiments were rotated 180 degrees for the benefit of left-handed customers. The following day, Burger King issued a follow-up release revealing that although, although the left-hand Whopper was a hoax, thousands of customers had gone into restaurants to request the sandwich. And simultaneously, according to the press release, many others requested their own right-handed version. But the propensity to believe for some people goes beyond nonsensical hoaxes. A New York Times article last October tells the story of how Stetson Parker and his wife Shannon recently took a trip through Colorado to celebrate their 10th anniversary. And as a part of that, they boarded the Durango Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad, a vintage train that provides historic and entertaining rides, according to a website. But what the Parkers saw from the last car wasn't advertised online. The couple believe they spotted the elusive creature Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch or Yeti. And this mythical ape-like giant creature who maybe wanders North America, who according to some definitely does exist, the most recent spotting captured in a widely shared video from that train adds to the growing catalog of sightings that have kept the myth alive amid a lack of what some might call verifiable proof. I'm definitely a believer now, Mr. Parker said. The video, which was taken by a fellow passenger and posted online by Mr. Parker, shows a tall, brownish creature walking and squatting before it blends into the surroundings. To him, Mr. Parker said, the creature didn't look human. It didn't move like a person, he said. It looked more like an ape, but it didn't walk like an ape so much. He added that the creature's arms seemed too long to be human, with hands reaching down to its knees. It didn't look like anything I've seen before, Mr. Parker said. I don't think it was, I don't think it was a hoax, but if it was, it was a really good one. I can tell you, I've watched the video of it, and uh, it was a really good hoax. So pranks and hoaxes have always existed, yet the disciple Thomas is list labeled as a doubter, because for him, evidence was necessary to enable and energize his belief that Jesus had indeed conquered death and vacated the tomb, Evidence that other disciples already had seen. And so if, if need for evidence is an unnecessary and improper criterion for belief in the resurrection, we might similarly label all of the apostles as doubters. Because the Gospel of Mark tells of how when Mary Magdalene reported to the other disciples that she had seen Jesus alive, they refused to believe it. Jesus reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe Mary. And in Mark's account, immediately afterward, Jesus instructed them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So hearing this command, the, the apostle realized they were being sent, not as a group, but they were to split up and not only to tell not only tell, but act upon the story of salvation by Jesus throughout the world. A staggering assignment for a group who had recently doubted his resurrection. So Thomas had a distinct part in this world-changing mission. The scriptures do not specify the details of Thomas's role. However, Hippolytus, a 2nd and 3rd century theologian and a historian, in a credible account, <clears throat> wrote in a credible account of the areas where each apostle worked. And he wrote that Thomas preached 
to the Parthians, the Medes, the Persians, the Hycranians, the Bactrians, and the Margians, and was thrust through the four members of his body with pine spears at Calamean, the city of India, and was buried there. According to Hippolytus, Hippolytus' account, Thomas led souls to faith in Jesus in an area stretching from today's northeastern Iran through Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. An area approximately the size of the easternmost 25 states in the U.S. Yet today, doubting Thomas is a popular idiom of speech, often used by people who have little idea who the apostle was, how mighty his faith was, or what he accomplished through his life and mission. The experience that Thomas had with Jesus is obviously one that none of us will ever have. He happened to be lucky enough to be born at the right time in human history and at the right geographical location to come into contact with Jesus. He was able to walk and talk with him and ask him any questions that came into his mind, and he was able to hear Jesus' response to those questions firsthand. So Thomas's situation was very different from ours today. Also, that he didn't have to decide whether or not Jesus was a real historical figure. He knew he was. But what he did have to decide, at least initially, was whether or not he believed the resurrection of Jesus was real. And as we heard in our scripture reading, he did not. He said, I won't believe until I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers in them and place my hand into the wound in his side. But here again, his situation was different from ours today. He ultimately did see Jesus' resurrected body, and at that moment, the reality of who Jesus was became even more real for him. So the question for all of us today, is Jesus real to us? Now for some, this question amounts to no more than an intellectual assent to the belief that Jesus was an actual human being who lived on this earth for a historical period of time. For others, it means believing that he was not only human, but also the Son of God in a unique way. And for many, it also includes a whole lot of other doctrines and dogmas. But what I am suggesting is that all of humanity should move beyond the question of whether Jesus was a real historical figure because there is ample evidence of this fact in many ancient writings, well beyond the Bible. And those who call themselves Christians should in some ways even move beyond the resurrection of Jesus, which we just celebrated last week. And what I mean by that is that we can't understand the reality of who the resurrected Jesus is today unless we understand the reality of who he was when he walked the face of the earth. But some Christians, although they would deny it, really want no part of the real Jesus. They would rather reinvent Jesus into a caricature that fits their own ideological and philosophical and political views. Their version of Jesus is of a carpenter who builds walls rather than bridges. Their version of Jesus is a man who ridicules and oppresses the poor instead of feeding them. Their version of Jesus is one who values sovereignty of nation over sanctity of immigrants. Their version of Jesus is one who praises prosperity rather than condemning rich fools. Their version of Jesus is one who views dominion over the earth as a license to pollute and pillage it. Their version of Jesus is one who is less concerned with the healing of people of their physical ailments than the cost of it. Their version of Jesus is one who displays narcissism and strength rather than humility and meekness. Their version of Jesus 
is one who would rather allow children to be killed by AR-15s than allow himself to be killed on a cross. And their version of Jesus is one who calls LGBTQ people sinful rather than calling out the sinful people who hate them. The examples go on and on. But the point is, the reality of who Jesus was and is cannot be changed. And although our perspective is limited, because Jesus isn't among us in the flesh as he was for Thomas, we still know enough about him not to mischaracterize him for selfish or political gain. The various versions of Jesus I just discussed are are no more real than the sightings of Bigfoot. And yet, people believe in Bigfoot. Those versions of Jesus are no more than April Fool's hoaxes, which are perpetrated upon gullible people who are more than willing to buy into a a narrative about Jesus that fits into their ideological perspective, whether consciously or unconsciously. Having said that, the truth is we are all susceptible to that manipulation, either as perpetrators of it or recipients of it. So the challenge for all of us is to separate the historical, real Jesus from the one who agrees with everything that we say and do, the Jesus that nods his head in an agreement with everything on our own party's platform and everything that the talking heads on our own favorite media tell us is right or wrong. The real Jesus did not and does not subscribe to all the tenets of any religion or nation or political doctrine. The real Jesus represented the nature of God and spoke the wisdom of God. We don't know all that he said or believed, especially in regard to some of our most complex issues of the day, right? But we know enough to live our lives authentically, authentically following him individually, if that is our desire. So, is Jesus real to me? That is the question we all should ask ourselves daily. And the answer to this question isn't predicated upon whether we see or believe in the resurrection the way Thomas ultimately did. The answer is contingent upon us desiring to live the way he lived and caring about the things he cared about. And if the answer to that question is yes, then may it be so, not only for us, but for all who claim his name. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we realize that we, and as your people today and in the year 2024, are not able to walk alongside of Jesus in the flesh to talk with him, to discuss issues with him in the way that his disciples did some 2,000 years ago. But yet, Lord, we, we have, through the Gospels, um, an image of Jesus that we can clearly see. And that image that we read of in the Gospels points us to the nature of God and the ultimate wisdom of God. So Lord, I just pray that we and and all of those who call themselves Christians, not only in our nation but in the world, Lord, would, would not seek to reinvent Jesus and to and to put upon him our own preferences and ideologies. But Lord, that we would receive who he truly is 
that we would convey that truth of the real Jesus to others and that we would seek to walk in his real way. In his name I pray. Amen. So at this time, I invite you all to stand once more, if you are able, as we sing together our closing hymn number 43, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. go from this place, may you indeed uh, receive and reflect uh, Jesus' unfailing love divine, the real love of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.